Hello, I'm Seth Worley. I'm a writer and director of uh, branded films and commercials for clients like Bad Robot, Sandwich Video, and most notably Red Giant, where for the past seven years I've served as a senior content creator, making short films and branded content to show off Red Giant's tools for visual effects and motion design. Uh, why don't I just show you my reel, uh, just to give you a visual for who I am and what I do. Now I know you're probably thinking, Wicked genius. Let me finish. That was pretty much it. Money, please. So you can see my work tends to skew uh, fairly comedic while leaning heavily into genre. I grew up inspired by filmmakers like Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg. I've always had a taste for VFX-heavy, high-concept stories. I started making short films for Red Giant back in 2011 with a short called Plot Device, which was created to showcase the power of Magic Bullet Suite's super awesome color correction tools. That was back when you could make a viral internet short and wind up directing a Thor movie three months later. I did not get the Thor movie, um, though I do know that Marvel folks are fans. Ah! That's really gross. But that short kicked off a series of shorts we continue to make here at Red Giant. The most recent being this one, called Darker Colors. Uh, here's the teaser for it. You couldn't be into like ponies or rainbows or something? You'd rather fight a pony? So there's a scene in Darker Colors where the character Jack creates this makeshift flamethrower out of an aerosol spray can and a lighter to keep this monster away from him. The monster's made of crayons, so if the monster gets anywhere near him, it will melt. For obvious reasons, we didn't want to hand an aerosol flamethrower to a child and ask him to wield it in a basement filled with wood. We opted to create the flame in post and after effects. A really helpful part of this was this practical light that we used on set to create interactive flame light on Jack's face. So anyway, here, let's dive in. So here's my plate, and I've gone ahead and pre-tracked three nulls to this scene. These three nulls are going to provide all the information that I need to be able to put the flame into the scene. I don't need a 3D camera track or anything. I just need this the motion data from these three points. I've got the scene null, which I tracked on the doorknob back here in the background, that is going to basically allow me to match the camera shake. Um, then I have this lighter null that is, as you would expect, attached to the end of the lighter. And then I have the spray null, which is tracked to the spray can. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a fourth null that I'm going to call the fire null. And then I'm just going to just parent it to the scene null. So now it will stay paired to the scene null no matter where I move it. And I'm going to come back to that. I'll explain in a second why I created that. So let's create a fire. I have this fire flamethrower asset that I'm pretty sure Andrew Kramer gave me a year ago when I started working on this short. If it wasn't you, Andrew, and you know who gave this to me... Uh, I don't know why you would know, but if, if you're out there and you this is your flamethrower, uh, great work, and please reach out and tell me so I can give you credit in things. Um, so I'm going to drag it into my comp, and I'm going to center it up here in the frame so uh, it is fully contained in the frame. 
and pretty pretty well centered. I lose some of that fire right there, so I'm gonna see if I can get all that in there. Okay, now I am going to uh, go to layer, pre-compose. I'm gonna pre-compose this fire, making sure I select move all attributes into the new composition, and I'm gonna call it fire. Now I'm gonna go to the puppet pen tool, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply two puppet points, one on this end of the fire, and one right here on the ignition point of the fire. And if I go down here into my mesh, I'm gonna turn these keyframes off, and I'm gonna parent the uh, pin position to the fire null, and I'm gonna parent this pin position to the lighter null. And the reason for doing that is because is because I want the flame to always be originating from the lighter, but I don't want the whole flame to float around with the lighter like it's some kind of 2D card attached to the lighter. I want the uh, end of the flame to stay in the, the quote-unquote three-dimensional space of the room. I want it to move with the handheld camera. So this is my workaround for doing that. There's probably an easier way to do this, uh, but that's kind of my brand, is doing it the hard way uh, because I wasn't ever properly educated. And here I am teaching you. So allow me to teach you the uneducated, weird version. I'm going to start with the ignition. I'm going to actually just use this pick whip here. First, I'm gonna make sure that I can see my lighter null position. I'm gonna take this pick, pick whip next to my pin two position, I'm gonna drag it down to the lighter null position, and boom, now it is attached to the lighter null. As you can see, this one, though, needs to go somewhere. So you would think that I should just take this pick whip and drag it to the fire null position, but it's way up here, even though the fire null is down here. And the reason for that is because the fire null is parented to a null of its own, to a spray null. So it throws off the, the math here, it throws off the numbers here. If I unparent it, you'll see now that's working the way that it should. But I need this null to parent to the seam null. So I'm going to fix this with some expressions. If I go down here and I can see the expression here that's allowing it to be parented to that position, I'm going to replace this transform.position with two comp and in parentheses brackets zero comma zero. And now it is parented to wherever that fire null is in relation to the rest of the comp. Within the comp, it will always stay stuck to that visual uh, position. Now, it's doing some weird bending there, and the way that we can get around that is go to our mesh expansion and turn that up. And now it does more stretching and oh, sorry, wrong. Now it does more stretching and squishing. So now I can. You'll see that if I hit play, the ignition is parented to the lighter but the fire is ultimately staying in that space in the air, parented to the scene null. All right, so for now, we're just going to turn off the fire layer so I can't see it. We're gonna move on to making our flame on the end of the lighter. So I'm gonna create a new solid. I'm gonna call it flame. And I'm gonna apply trap code particular. And you'll see I've got this emitter sitting here in the middle of, of the comp. I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to parent the position of the emitter. I'm going to actually parent it to the lighter. And I'm going to do that by going down here to the controls, make sure my lighter null position is visible, and I'm going to alt click and I'm going to drag this pick whip down to the lighter null position. And then because this is a two dimensional uh, null that we are parenting to, that Z space needs to just stay zero. So I'm going to replace that 
one right there with zero. That third one is the Z parameter. All right, so now it's pairing it to the lighter. Now let's turn that into a flame, shall we? I'm going to start by I'm going to start by turning the velocity down to zero in the emitter. I'm going to go to my particle, and I'm going to make sure that it's a sphere. I'm going to change the size to maybe like 20. And then size over life, I'm going to have that be constantly scaling down. And the opacity over life, I'm going to have that start at zero, crank up to, zero, to 100, and then go back down. Now, this is way too long, so we need to turn our life down. Let's turn our life down to maybe 0.25. Now it's super small, but we're starting to see some flame, more flamey looking flames there. So, let's go to our, set our, our uh, blend mode to add. Uh, we can't see any difference, but we'll see it when we do this uh, color. Color over life. And drop this down and you see these gradients, these ramps that are uh, provided. I'm going to do this one because it's a simple two color gradient. I'm going to start it at black. Then I'm going to have one right after it that, that goes to like a blue. And then immediately up to like a flame, you know, orange-ish color. That looks pretty terrible to be quite honest. Maybe it's too saturated. A little too long, actually, too. Let's turn our flame uh, life to maybe 0.15. That's a little more flamey. I'd say the blue is too saturated, too. Too dark. Let's maybe try that. We've got kind of a flame, but, you know, we're seeing the particles kind of break up here when it moves real fast. So we can, can go to motion blur, turn that on, but it's still, I feel like we're still getting some of that particle breakdown there. So that can be fixed by changing our particles per second. Let's just double it to 200. Now that's a solidish looking frame, but of a flame. But you know, the thing is, it's, it's not, when it, when it's not moving, it's just a little dot. So let's go into our physics. Let's turn gravity. Let's literally crank it back. Like negative 2,000, negative, let's go negative 5,000. Look, now we're seeing flames. Maybe a little too strong. Turn it down a notch. Now that's feeling like a flame now, right? Feeling like a flame. That's a real song, and I just sang it for you. Cinema 4D Live. So, now we've got our flame. Let's move on to our spray, shall we? I'm going to create a new solid. I'm going to call it spray. And I'm going to apply a trap particular. Now, uh... Just like before, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to parent the position to the spray nulls position. Alt click. Drag that pick whip down here to spray null position. Fix that Z uh, to be zero. Fix that Z. And now it is parented to the spray. We're going to crank up velocity to mean something like Let's go like 7,000 or something. Now that looks pretty absurd. Let's change the direction to directional. And the Y rotation, let's crank it around to where it's facing toward camera and toward that light, actually, that lighter, actually. You know, we need some more particles per second. Let's do like 2,000. Now it's going pretty far. Let's turn our particle life down to maybe like, uh, let's do the 0.15. Maybe even 0.1. Now you see our spray is getting as far as it needs to. It's getting to the lighter. Might have cranked it around too far. There we go. Now I've got some spray happening. 
think our direction spread is a little too much. Let's put it maybe 13%. That's X rotation up a bit. Right about there. Now what do you say we go to rendering, motion blur, turn that on. That looks like a pretty decent spray from aerosol spray. So now we need to combine all of them. Well but first Notice our flame kind of comes on a little too early. Our fire comes on a little too early. As our flame, two things that I see that need to be fixed. One, our flame stays lit even while the fire is spewing out of it. That flame needs to pretty much disappear once the fire hits. So the other part is that the fire hits before the flame hits the spray. That's easy, we'll just drag this fire comp to where we feel like the fire is starting at a reasonable time. Now let's turn that fire off when we want it to, turn the flame off when we want it to turn off. I'm gonna go to particles per second. I'm gonna keyframe that to go down to zero by that point. Maybe a little sooner, huh? That feels good. So now we're going to composite this stuff. And we're going to do that using Red Giant Super Comp. Super Comp is part of uh, VFX Suite. It's amazing. It's a dockable compositing user interface that works seamlessly within After Effects. Why would you need that? Well, I'll, let me show you. I could composite it here uh, in my comp, but the thing is, uh, the fire, I want the fire to have heat blur behind it. I want it to blur the background behind it. I want it to also have a glow. And that would require creating some additional uh, adjustment layers that are track matted to the fire. It would require a lot of uh, creating new layers. Rather than doing that, I'm just going to use Super Comp. I'm going to select my plate, my fire, my flame, and my spray. Go to Effect, RGV Effects, Super Comp. And it immediately creates a new solid. Uh, with all of these layers in uh, Super Comp, and it allows me to work. Now, why would I work in Super Comp? Well, first off, it's great. That's really all you need to know, is that it's great. But um, additionally, the uh, Super Comp communicates upward with layers. So if I apply a glow to this bottom layer, it, that glow will wrap around and influence the light of the layers above it. If I apply a light wrap to a layer up here on the top, it will that light wrap will be influenced by all the light on all the layers underneath it, which is not something that is not the way that the After Effects comp, comp uh, naturally works. So, um, let me show you why this thing is super comp is so great for compositing a shot like this. I'm gonna start with my fire. I'm gonna turn my flame and my spray assets off. I've got my fire. I'm gonna change the layer type to additive, and now it's it's uh, it's been properly blended into the scene, but I want to add some heat blur, I want to add some optical glow. I can do this, um, you know, manually on my own. I can go here and add a heat blur. I can turn blur up pretty big. Let's zoom in and see kind of what the, all this is doing. So the layer behind it is being blurred. Turn that off, turn it back on. You can see there's some blur going on behind it. Uh, if I wanted to, I could add some displacement too cranking that up real high so you can see kind of what it's doing and what it looks like. Uh, I also want to add some glow. Uh, optical glow is pretty great. That's pretty strong. So if I put it down to 5, turn the size up to maybe 100, 500 even. Now I've got this really nice glow happening. If I put it to 4, let's turn vibrance up to 100. That's looking pretty sweet. Now, one thing you might notice... And that's looking pretty sweet. Uh, however, check this out. 
I could do that if I wanted to control and I wanted to do it manually on my own. Or I could just use these presets. And these presets were created by the team at Red Giant, including Stu Mashwitz, who worked on Twister. So basically, if you you can composite this thing yourself, or you can have a guy who worked on Twister composite it. Pretty confident what the right answer is there. Twister, always. So I'm gonna go with this Explosion Core preset. That gives me this color corrected, a slightly uh, lowered exposure color correction that gives me the heat blur. It gives me a core mat, which uh, is essentially, essentially darkens the alpha behind the flame so that, so that brighter uh, layers that you're compositing as an additive mode onto brighter backgrounds will pop uh, better. Well, actually, you'll be able to see them better even with brighter backgrounds. And then it has uh, an optical glow on it. So we'll just kind of go with that right out of the box. Now, uh, one thing you might notice, the plate, the plate you'll notice is uh, in a slightly flatter color space. It's in log color space. Uh, we shot on Aerie Alexa. All the footage from the film is in log. And our colorist, Ryan McNeil at Arcam Studios, uh, obviously would prefer to work within one color space. Uh, so it'd be great if I could render these shots out in log to match the rest of the footage in my timeline. And that can be tricky when you're compositing elements that are not in log, like this flame. Uh, so Supercomp makes it super easy uh, with this gamma setting. You can go here and specify that this footage is in Alexa log C. And you see what happened there. It changed how it is rendered. It converted it to a uh, video color space. Uh, and so if I have each of these assets uh, specified for what color space they're in, it helps create this cohesive uh, color space across all of the elements in the plate. But this is the coolest part. I can output it to any one of these color spaces as well. So I set my overall output gamma to Alexa log C, and it is now converting all the elements in it to one singular color space. That's pretty awesome. Now I'm going to keep working with this in the video color space because it looks better um, while I'm working. But I can always turn it back to the log C when I'm ready to uh, render at my final render. So, got our fire. Let's go in here and uh, comp our flame in. Let's go to a frame where we can see it. I'm gonna, because I'm lazy, I'm gonna use a preset. Well, first I'm going to make sure it's an additive layer. And then I could go with this big fire preset. It's not. It's a very small little element, so it's not a huge, big, huge deal. But I'm gonna go with explosion core because it matches the fire that I did. Then in my spray, I'm actually gonna use uh, this blended mist preset, which gives it a blur behind, which blurs the layer uh, behind it. It uh, applies a light wrap to help integrate it better, a haze to help it uh, sink into the image a little more and not be so bold, and some diffusion. And now it's looking pretty good. I'm actually gonna go ahead and put this fire on top of everything. So now if I play this back, this looks pretty great. Now, a couple things I'm gonna fix. The spray, I think, uh, could be a little more directional. I'm gonna lower the direction spread even more. And then the fire, I feel like, could be going a little further and upward a little more. So, I'm gonna go to my fire null. I'm gonna bring it up and out a little more. So it's going farther. So that looks pretty awesome right there. I actually think our spray is a little too high. Going to bring that down a bit.
now we're looking good. So I'm going to uh, apply, and I'm going to add a look to this just because I can. I often did this while I was working. I, I did the temporary color grade on the film. I did not do the final color grade. The final color grade was done by Ryan McNeil uh, using looks in uh, DaVinci Resolve. I'm, I would, my process for this, I would go through and apply a one of these uh, LUTs that I have in here that are from, let's actually go to a more exciting frame. It's a preview. I've used looks to actually host a whole bunch of LUTs that I have from Ryan Connolly and various other places. These are try-in cinematic LUTs that Ryan Connolly sells. I like this one from Drive. I'm going to put that in there. So that looks pretty rad. So you can see Supercomp is amazing for getting amazing results super fast and super easy. Let me show you how I used it to integrate uh, some monsters into a shot. This is a, a shot featuring uh, one of our monsters called Eiders. They are these eyeballs uh, with spider legs made from chalk. Uh, features a bunch of Eiders coming down the tree. I can actually show you a final render of what it looked like. So here's kind of what I did uh, to achieve this, how this worked. So I'm going to turn my looks, my super comp, and a bunch of my uh, layers off. Started with this plate, pretty simple, you know, trees. Uh, then I have element layer, which if I put this in uh, draft mode, you can see what all's going on here. I've got all of my groups in element working on, toward this look. So. Hashi, Daniel Hashimoto, yeah, you've probably seen his talk already. Um, he had this brilliant idea to hire our friend Matt Walker to create a bunch of animation cycles of these eiders uh, of you know hang, dangling, uh, uh, basically loopable animations. He had uh, dangling versions of the eiders. You had slow crawls, uh, fast crawls, some jumps. And I, he went and animated all of those for us. And I could bring them all in here with Element 3D uh, so that I could actually build the scenes in After Effects, which is the, it's just the user interface that I personally know because I'm so dumb. You can see here, we've got, you know, this slow creep animation cycle. Uh, I've got that assigned to one and, group one and group two, and I'll explain why in a second. Group three, I've got the cylinder, which you can't see now. Uh, because it is rendering out as a matte shadow. It's a cylinder. When I click matte shadow, it collects. It will. It will basically be serving as a shadow catcher uh, to catch shadows and ambient occlusion and contact shadows on the and make it look like the shadow is on the tree surface. Then I've got these dangling eiders that are. I've got ones where their you know hands are going downward. I've got ones where. They are uh, dangling uh, up, or their feet are going upwards. So with all that stuff in here, I have uh, groups one and two. So I'm going to turn off groups three and four just to show you how this is all working. I've got groups one and two are both the same things. They are these slow creep eiders. And I'm using the animation engine. Uh, in here. So if I go in here and I turn the animation engine off, you'll see there's more riders. There's ones in the background and ones in the foreground. And that's because my group one are all back there. And then group two is essentially the same group, but I've moved them all forward and scattered them a little bit uh, uh, going back and, and forward. So by turning the animation engine on, and saying the start group is group one, the finish group is group two, I can slide this animation uh, knob here and it will move the eiders back and forth, back and forth. And what that's doing is basically interpolating animation between the placements of the eiders in group one and in group two. And I can use that to have this anim with a lot working with our animation cycles uh, of the slow creep, I now can create 
the illusion that these eiders are slowly walking down the tree without having to do very much animation at all. Turn group three on. That turns my shadow catcher back on, my, my uh, turns my shadow mat back on. Uh, and I'll show you kind of what that's doing by turning the full render on. You can see it's creating that shadow on there and it's also occluding all of the eiders on the other side of the cylinder. So going back to the draft, I'll turn group four on. Group four is this one lone eider that is moving faster than the others that I have hand animated to kind of be our little hero eider to scurry in and foreground. And then group five, Are all of our dangling eiders. I have depth of field on in here. Uh, now you can see when I turn back to full render. All right, so I want to composite these guys here into the scene. Um, and you know, I'll go ahead and turn off super comp so I can kind of start this from scratch. Uh, additionally, with these, uh, the background, the plate, and element layer, I also have this. Dust layer that I have, uh, the Action VFX makes. Those guys have some amazing, uh, awesome stock elements like dust, explosions, all kinds of stuff. So I have that in there, colorized to be red to kind of put some dust in the air. Uh, with my plate and elements and my dust selected, I'll go to RGVFX, Super Comp. So that's what it looks like right off the bat. My plate, I shot Alexa, I shot, you know, Alexa log C, so I'm gonna boost that there. Now that, it's kinda uggs, because uh, those highlights are pretty blown out. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna keep working in Alexa log C space, so that I can retain this information when I do the color grade. Now, element, I'm gonna turn off the dust here. Uh, I can do a couple things, I can use some presets, Etc. But actually, I'm going to go and I'm going to start with this color correction. I'm going to show you this cool new thing that we have in VFX Suite 1.5, which allows you to push this button and it will automatically match. It will do a color matching based on the plate, based on any of the visual information behind it. And it's going to base that on the visual information behind only the only contained within the alpha of the layer you're applying this to. So it's looking at the information at the visual information at the black points and white points, it's determining the average black point and white point uh, from the information behind the eiders. And it uses that to determine how dark the darkest points in the eiders should be and how bright the brightest points should be. And that looks pretty dang great. I'm gonna also go in and add a reverse light wrap, which is something that you really won't see the difference there. You'll feel it more than you'll see it. Um, reverse light wrap is, you know, the opposite of light wrap. If you were to erase this tree somehow from this shot, you would still get a weird rim of, like, uh, of tree ghost um, around the edges because that's because uh, these images are not pixel perfect. There is spillage of color and light around all, uh, these individual elements. And so we want to create a, that illusion. We can I can turn that up a whole lot on these eiders. Turn the size up really big and you start to see kind of like the reverse light wrap around it that it's creating. Turn that off and back on. It's almost like a drop shadow kind of a thing. It's just this, you know, gross bleed. I'm going to keep it at you know, edit settings. And then the last thing I'll go in here and I'll probably... Nah, that's good. Now here's a fun trick that I like to do. I'm gonna go to my plate and I'm gonna actually gonna add optical glow there. Because if I add a glow, like I told you before, if you add, and that looks gross, so I'm gonna fix this, but if you, like I said before, if I add a glow to this layer below, that glow will wrap around any of these layers above it. So this is a nice, really quick way to integrate the things, um, to integrate these uh, elements into the scene is to add an optical, I found I like adding an optical glow to my plate, and I turn highlights only 
I mean, up to like, let's do like 75. Let's maybe go higher, maybe 85. So it's only glowing the highlights of the image. I'm gonna turn the size to like 500. And turn the amount down to like three, two. Let's maybe go highlights only up to 90. Maybe size down to 200. Gosh, maybe 100. And it creates this kind of haze in the air that is wrapping around the eiders. Actually looking pretty cool. Here it is without, here it is with. I like it, it creates this kind of halation almost. I just used that term wrong, but who cares? It's my tutorial. I'll use whatever words I want. So uh, now these wide dust particles, I'm gonna integrate them using one of these presets here. I'm gonna go maybe try backlit smoke. Does that make it? it makes it a little too smoky and misty and weird. Let's maybe try hazy integration. It's a little weird. I mean, it's kind of cool, but also kind of not. Like maybe. What if I add color correction and I auto match it? Ooh, that's a lot of red. That's pretty cool. Then maybe I'll add some haze. It's an awful lot of stuff happening, but huh, it's kind of cool. Maybe too much. Could always pump the opacity down to maybe like 50. And then I have this overall look that I apply to it at the end. Yeah, that red, that's too much going on with these wide particles. It's actually, there it is as is. Let's maybe apply some light smoke, maybe that's the look for it. This is how I use Super Comp to composite all the monsters into darker colors.